Hi, this is Jeff Spence, your Math 135 instructor for the Community College of Denver, and this is our video lecture over Section 3.4, titled Measures of Position and Outliers. So to remind you in, uh, what we've done so far in Chapter 3, in 3.1 and 3.2, is we're working with quantitative data sets, and we're looking to numerically summarize them with as many statistics as possible. In 3.1, we talked about measures of center, the mean, the median, and mode. And we're primarily going to be using the mean and median. In this section, we'll be specifically using the mean. In 3.2, we talked about measures of spread or variability. So we looked primarily at the range and standard deviation. So those two things about a quantitative data set are really the most important, the mean or the center and the, the range or the standard deviation to measure the spread. We're going to use both of those uh, measures in this section when we calculate what's called a z-score. So, z-score is the first thing we're going to calculate. We're going to explain how to do it, what it means, what it's useful for. I can't emphasize enough that z-scores are going to be the most important thing that we do throughout the course. We're going to use them frequently, and they will describe to us where a data value is as far as position in a data set. We're also going to find percentiles and talk about percentile ranks for a little bit. We're just going to touch on that subject and then we'll uh, t uh, get into more detail later in the course. We're also going to compute quartiles in the inner quartile range. That's a typo there, but compute quartiles in the inner quartile range. And we're going to detect outliers using the inner quartile range. So we're actually going to have a way to say this is an outlier or not, not just we think it's an outlier. So let's start with z-scores. The term z-score basically indicates how many standard deviations a particular data value is from the mean. So I'll come back to that definition again. We have two different formulas, but they're essentially the same, folks. Uh, don't worry about too much. I'll give you both formulas, but they're, the mathematics are exactly the same. So a z-score is basically its relative position to the mean, and the unit is the standard deviation. So for any data value, any data value in a data set, we can compute a z-score. So we take that data value and we subtract it from the mean. That will tell us how far that data value is from the mean. But that's a, the unit for that is whatever unit the data set is. So in order to convert it to how many standard deviations it is from the mean, that's why we divide by the standard deviation in the bottom. Whether it be the, popular, the sample mean here, or the population mean and population standard deviation, it does not matter. We're going to take each data value, subtract, subtract the mean from that to figure out how far it is from the mean, and then divide by the standard deviation, and that will tell us how many standard deviations a particular data value is from the mean. So let's do an example. So the SAT, the math SAT, is designed to have a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100 points. So let's say Jasmine's math SAT score was 650. How do we find her z-score? Well, here's a picture. Looks like, you know, 500 is in the middle. Uh, the other thing that's uh, implied in this problem is that SAT scores, and we'll talk about this over and over, are normally distributed, meaning they follow the shape of a bell curve. So the mean goes in the middle. That's the 500 right there. And we can count off by 100s and show, okay, this 600 is one standard deviation above the mean, 700 is two standard deviations above the mean, 800 is three, and so on. 400 is one standard deviation below the mean, 300 is two, and so on. Now, if we want to find her exact position, we follow the formula. So, here's our formula. Z equals her data value, 650, the X, minus the mean of 500, divided by the standard deviation of 100. So remember when we did this day one on the calculator, you got to do 650 minus 500, press enter, and then divide by 100 because there's uh, implied parentheses in the numerator. So 650 minus 500 is 150, 150 divided by 100 is 1.5. And we can see that Jasmine's score is exactly one and a half standard deviations above the mean. So we can do a z-score, remember, for any SAT score, it could be below the mean, in which it's negative, or above the mean, in which it's positive, or equal to the mean, in which it is zero. But we have this formula to use. You'll have that available to you. You do not need to memorize it. The other useful thing for z-scores is that we can, we can use them to compare. So first of all, the first thing a z-score tells you is just 
your position relative to the mean. So if you're positive, you're above the mean. If you're negative, you're below the mean. And if you're zero, you're equal to the mean. But the other thing z-scores can be used for is comparing different data sets. Relative positions can be compared even when the means and standard deviations of the data sets are different. So for instance, like we can compare the heights of men, like, like I can do the z-score for my height as a man, and we can compare the z-score for a woman uh, relative to each group. So for instance, men's heights uh, in America, we have an average height that is higher than women and a different standard deviation of heights than women. So I can do a z-score for my height and a woman can do a z-score for her height. And even though she may be shorter than me, she may be relatively taller for women than I am relatively tall for men. So that's an example. Another thing you could do is you can compare how you did in different tests, SAT like the SAT math and the SAT verbal. The math and verbal te uh, test sections could have different means. Maybe people do better on the math than they do generally on the verbal. So even though you get a raw score of 650 on the math and a raw score of 625 on the verbal, the verbal score may be better relative to the verbal scores that everybody has because different means and different standard deviations result in different z-scores. So comparisons between two different data sets is another useful thing for z-scores, and that's something we'll be doing a lot in the classwork. The other thing we can do with z-scores, the last thing, is go back and find a data value given a z-score. So let's say, hey, we know that my z-score on the SAT math was 2.3. Let's figure out what the actual raw score was for, for that z-score. So we give you these formulas as well. Uh, and once again, they are the exact same. The only difference is whether or not we're using the population symbols or the sample symbols. However, the math is exactly the same. So X is our data value. It equals the Z-score times the standard deviation plus the mean. Basically, this is an algebraic solving of our Z-score formula right there. But we give you the formula. We're not doing any algebra and statistics, so we'll just give you the formula. So here's some examples. Using the mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100 of the SAT from the previous example, what score corresponds to a z-score of 2.3? So for instance, x, the data value, we're trying to figure out that raw SAT score equals 2.3 times the standard deviation of 100 plus the mean of 500. Do the math, you'll get 730. Or if we want to find, so that's a 730 SAT score, which is pretty good. We can also look at a z-score that's negative. If the z-score is negative 1.4, x would end up being 360, which is below the mean. And if the z-score is 0, the data value ends up being the mean itself. 0 times 100 is 0, plus 500 gives us 500. So we can go both ways with z-scores. We can go from a data value to a z-score, and a, a z-score back to a data value. Another thing uh, that we want to do here, sorry about that previous slide, is we want to detect unusual values with z-scores. So that last box that I skipped through, don't even pay attention to that. We're not going to detect outliers that way. Generally, uh, on a normal distribution, anything within two standard deviations of the mean is pretty usual, you know, uh, uh, like heights or SAT scores. Most people fall within two standard deviations of the mean. And when we get a data value in there, we don't look at it as anything being uh, anything unusual. Now when you get to beyond two standard deviations in these green zones here, beyond two, or in between two and three, we look at that as being moderately unusual. And then if you're beyond three, we call that real unusual. Not necessarily outliers, we're gonna use a different definition, but um, some people do consider them outliers, but we'll just call anything beyond three standard deviations to be very unusual. So anybody who's three standard deviations above the mean in terms of height is very, very tall or even short they were below the mean. All right, another per measure of position, so that was z-scores. Another measure of position is percentiles and percentile ranks. Essentially the same thing, um, but basically, you know, when you, were, when you were young and you were growing up and you went into the doctor's office, they measured your height and your weight and things like that and compared you on a percentile scale. Or if you took the Iowa test of basic skills when you're young, or if you took the SAT, Every time when you take those, those tests, they report your score as a percentile. Generally, when you want to take tests, you want to have a high percentile. Uh, 
A percentile is a percentage of people that are at or equal to you or below you. So if you scored 95% on the math SAT, that means that 95% are equal to you or below. So that's the, the percentage of people that are basically below you. So the higher the percentile, the better on, say, taking a test. If you're in the 80th percentile for your height, that means that 80% of the people in the world are either the same height as you or less. So that's what a percentile means. We just want you to know that that's what a percentile means. We'll go we'll come back to computing percentiles later. So we're not actually going to compute the what what the formula shows here in the bottom box. But basically, a percentile is basically the percent that's equal to you or below you. The last measure of position we're going to talk about, which also gives us a measure of spread, is called the quartiles. Quartiles are uh, measures that basically divide up the data set into quarters. So you can see this picture here down in the lower right hand corner. Um, we, we, get, we have the min, Q1, Q2, which is always the median, Q3, and the max. And it divides up the data set into quarters. One, two, three, four. So generally the first quartile is considered the 25th percentile. The second quartile which is also the median, remember that, the second quartile is always the median, is considered the 50th percentile, meaning right in the middle of that data set. And the third quartile is the 75th percentile, meaning 75% of the data is below that. So the quartiles are, how we find quartiles, they're basically medians of medians. Let me go back to that, okay? So in order to find the quartiles, you find the median first, quartile two. Quartile 1 is just the median of every data value that's to the left of the median. So it's a median of the first half of the data, while Q3 is the median of the second half of the data. So remember, quartiles, like, just like medians, are resistant to skewed, or sorry, to extreme values. So even though there may be really big values out on the lower end or the higher end, the quartiles are generally resistant to extreme values, just like the median is. So then from that, we can compute what's called the inner quartile range. We call it a robust measure of variability, meaning it's not sensitive to extreme values because it, they're basically Q3 and Q1 are medians of the, the first half of the data set and the second half of the data set. So um, want to compute the inner quartile range, I'll give you this formula. It's Q3 minus Q1. If you look back at the picture, it's just the distance between Q3 here and Q1. And it's generally interpreted to be the spread of the middle 50% of the data. 50% of that data lies between Q3 and Q1. So this is very much like a range, but we use Q3 and Q1 to figure out the interquartile range. So here's an example of what that would look like. Here's 12 data values. The median is right here in the middle. Quartile 1 is the median of the first half. Quartile 3 is the median of the second half. The interquartile range here would be 83 minus 59, which is 24. So what else we're going to use the uh, interquartile range for is determining outliers. Since the interquartile range is, is sen or not sensitive to extreme values, it's a good way to get a, a distance uh, away from the rest of the data set to say, okay, that data value is so far away, that's going to be an outlier. So what we do to determine outliers using the interquartile range is we compute what's called an upper fence and a lower fence. You will also have these formulas on your formula sheet. And the upper fence is the third quartile, quartile 3, plus 1.5 times the IQR. So it takes 1.5 times the distance of the IQR and adds it on to Q3. That gives us an upper fence, which should be above Q3 and is the boundary for, for outliers. The lower fence is Q1, the opposite end, the left end, minus the same distance, 1.5 times the IQR. We're minusing because we're going to the left, and we want a boundary on the left-hand side. So the upper fence is your boundary on the right-hand side. Your lower fence is the boundary on the left-hand side. Any data value that is above the upper fence or below the lower fence is considered an outlier. Sometimes I say this too. If a data value is outside the fence or outside the fences, it's considered an outlier. So outside, outlier. So what we do is we figure out 
Q3, Q1 first, then do the subtraction to get the IQR, then we follow the upper fence and the lower fence formula. We have those ends, and then we look at the data set again and see if there's any values that are above the upper fence or below the lower fence, and we call that an outlier and sometimes get rid of it. So that's the end of this section. Remember, z-scores are by far the most important, but in this section we will be uh, talking and using the interquartile range in determining outliers. Be very familiar with this formula, the z-score formula. Let me go back to it here. Right there in the upper right-hand corner. And we're going to do, do these computations a lot. It's always the data value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Understanding that a z-score is how many standard deviations a particular data value is from the mean is going to be uh, asked of you over and over again. So please remember that, and we'll see you next time.